One of the key elements of armed self-defense is mechanics. How do you keep the pistol running? Loading, unloading, clearing malfunctions? It's essential to being skilled with armed self-defense. Join me now. The program I've put together on training yourself or being trained by someone else on armed self-defense is made up of what we call the three M's. Marksmanship is the first thing that we do. It's the most common thing that we do. Marksmanship skills you need to survive a gunfight are typically rather low. Okay, these things happen very close. They are fast. So you're not needing the fine precision of a, of a perfect sight alignment and an absolute trigger control. Flash sight pictures, slapping the trigger in a controlled fashion at high speed will probably give you the marksmanship skills you need. The next of those three M's that I talk about, marksmanship mechanics, which is running the gun. How do you load it? How do you keep it loaded? Both tactical loads and speed loads. And how do you clear malfunctions when they happen? And we're going to talk about why that's so important. The last of the three M's is mindset. That'll be the next video we do. It's really the most important. If you've got your mind right, and you can run the mechanics of keeping the gun running, the marksmanship problems will probably take care of themselves. All right, why do I emphasize mechanics so much, and, and especially the clearing of malfunctions? Uh, most folks nowadays that are carrying a pistol for self-defense are carrying a semi-automatic of some kind. Revolvers are, in, in many ways, much more reliable. They are less likely to malfunction However, they can get what we might call a jam. My definition of that is a malfunction is something you can clear with your hands fairly quickly, where a jam is pretty serious. It may take tools, it may take time, and you may be out of action. Okay? So revolvers are more reliable, but they can still have problems that we need to address. Semi-automatics can malfunction. I would argue that one of the most reliable pistols ever designed is the Glock 17 9mm. New York City Police Department has carried Glock 17s for a number of years and they keep some of the most detailed records of their officer involved shootings of any agency out there. They call it SOP 9, Standard Operating Procedure 9 addresses the use of deadly force and the record keeping that goes with that. And what they tell us is that NYPD experiences approximately a 20 percent malfunction rate during gunfights on the street and this is with a pistol the 9mm Glock 17 this is with a pistol that is very possibly the most reliable semi-automatic handgun ever made yet 20 percent of the time they experience malfunctions why because of what I've been saying through this series what happens on the street isn't like anything that happens on the range on the range we are typically upright standing firing rounds to score on targets. Gunfights are very exciting. They're, they're dramatic, they're mo they involve movement. You may be banging the gun against a doorway or rubbing it against something. You're not gonna have that perfect range grip. You're not gonna have that perfect stance. And so we can get malfunctions. We have to fight through those malfunctions. We have to get the gun back in action if we're gonna win those gunfights. I want to talk a little bit about carry condition. There are still people out there who consider a semi-automatic pistol to be unsafe with a round in the chamber. And so they carry their concealed pistols with an empty chamber. That means when they draw, they're going to have to come up, cycle the slide, then get on target and engage to save their life. That's an additional step that is absolutely unnecessary. When I was in the Army, the MPs were still carrying 1911 pistols, and they carried them with an empty chamber by policy. So the first thing they had to do was put around in the chamber. And a lot of military policemen had, had invented a way to partially draw their 
their, we their weapon from the holster, turn it, hook the rear sight on the ledge that was inside the holster, stroke that pistol down hard to chamber the round, and then come up. They fought through the policy that made them carry an, an essentially unloaded pistol. If you're not carrying a round in the chamber, if you are not confident enough of your gun handling skills to carry around in the, in the chamber of your semi-automatic pistol, then you need to work on it. Then you have no business out there trying to protect yourself with that handgun until you know how to run it better. That's the bottom line. Put a round in the chamber, be prepared to handle it. Okay, A Glock, a safe action, you've got a trigger pull away, you've got a couple of internal safeties but really no physical safeties that you need to get out of the way. With a 1911 pistol, older style, but in many ways better to shoot because they have great trigger pulls and great accuracy if they're, if they're well put together, okay, we're going to carry this pistol round in the chamber, hammer cocked, safety engaged, cocked and locked. Seems very dangerous way to carry a gun, but it is the most safe way to do it and at the same time the most ready. When we draw this pistol, it's simply on target, safety comes off, finger goes on the trigger, and we're ready to engage. Uh, there's an old story about a federal agent one time that was carrying a 1911 pistol, cocked and locked, um, openly, and some lady came up and talked to him who apparently knew a little bit about guns, and she said, excuse me, sir, do you realize your pistol is cocked? And he goes, yes, ma'am. She said, isn't that dangerous? And he said, yes, ma'am, it is. Weapons are dangerous. You need to know how they run, you need to know how to handle them effectively, and you need to be able to, to get over that hurdle of them being dangerous and make sure that they're only dangerous to people who are threatening your life. They're not dangerous to you. So you've got to be able to run these guns and, and have that skill set so deeply programmed in yourself that it's really it's the it's the mid the midbrain the kind of alligator part of your brain that only runs on programming, and if you do this effectively, that part of your brain can take over the management of running the gun while your forebrain your your creative thinking part of your brain is dealing with identifying the target. Is this a situation where I should be shooting? Is this a target that I should engage? And let your midbrain keep the gun running. We can program you to that level. I've seen it work. I know it can work. Part of the situation that we have to include in mechanics is the draw stroke. What kind of holster do you carry inside the waistband and outside the waistband? Appendix carry is very popular and depending on the weapon and your body build, it can be a very effective way to carry. Hunting. I've carried pistols hunting for big game hunts for a number of years and carrying them on a belt is really not a good way to do it if you're slinging a rifle or carrying a backpack. Uh, for years I searched for a good way. A cross draw holster was okay but a lot of times that interfered with backpack straps. Uh, and I'll illustrate a chest holster design now that uh, was un unusual for a few years. Now it's becoming quite popular where we're really carrying that pistol right here on the chest. It's out of the way of shoulder straps, it's out of the way of uh, rifle slings. We can get to it very quickly. If you are living in bear country out west, or now with the advent of wolves being reintroduced, it's a good idea to have a pistol on you all the time, just in case. You need to know how to draw those weapons and how to carry them securely on your person. One thing that's evolved over the years is that uh, when you have a pistol out, you're not, in, you're not engaged in firing, but you're perhaps about to be. We used to use a ready pistol, depressed pistol to about 45 degrees. What you're seeing now kind of evolved from SWAT teams into uh, to regular cops now, and I'm seeing civilians do it as well. In, instead of depressing that pistol, which requires you to come up sharply to get the sights on target, when you move that up, it, it has to stop. And a lot of times when it stops, it bounces, so it kind of slows down the process of getting your sights on target. So a lot of times now the ready position is folded back into your chest. Okay, we're, we're watching that muzzle. We're not going to flag our feet or legs. We're not going to endanger anyone around us. But this way we are at a ready pistol position. But when in time comes to engage the target, we simply push it out. Those, those sights stay on that plane. They come on sight very readily. And we can engage the target a lot quicker. 
I'm going to give you examples of, of when to load and unload. There are really two types of reloading. A speed load or an emergency load is when the weapon is locked back. Okay, we would have an empty magazine in there at the time. When this happens, we have no ammunition available. We need to drop that magazine clear. We need to go for our spare magazine wherever we keep it. Insert it. And there are two ways to release the slide. Typically, in the old days, we would pull down on the slide release lever, drop the slide. You can use your thumb. Some uh, weapons have both sides. You could use it with the trigger finger over here. It's a little bit of a fine motor skill. It's something I think you can learn if you do enough. Um, but there is an alternative method. Note that I'm using dummy rounds here. Any of this kind of practice at home, not live fire on the range, you need to be using dummy rounds. The alternative to cycling that slide to put that round back in the chamber is, weapon's empty, I drop my magazine, I insert the new magazine, and then I come over the slide like this. I pull back, releasing it, you hear that click when the slide latch releases and it goes forward. This is a gross motor skill as opposed to a fine motor skill. It's probably going to be something you do better under stress. Either system will work. Most police agencies nowadays are teaching that handover to drop the slide and get the weapon back in action. With a tactical load, we have a break in the action. We have cover. We have time to uh, work a little differently, but we know that we have fired some rounds out of the pistol. It's not completely full. We want to top it off so that we're ready for whatever may come after us. Several different ways to do it, but you're going to drop that magazine. You can catch it in this hand, or you can tuck it. You go for a fully loaded magazine off your belt or storage location. You seat it in place. Then retain this weapon. Put it in a pocket. If you only have one carrier, you can put it back in there. You know you have some rounds left. You don't know how many for sure, most likely. But now we're topped back off. This is a Glock 48. It holds 10 plus 1. I got 11 rounds now. If I'm with a Glock 17, I'm up to 18 rounds now. That should be enough for any kind of problem you're going to engage. So tactical, I save the magazine, I save the rounds that I have, but it's not a fast kind of operation. I need to have cover, I need to have a break in the action. If I've shot it to dry, then I'm going to do an emergency load or a speed load. And that's simply drop old magazine, new magazine in, cycle the slide, come back on target. The malfunctions we're going to demonstrate for you. With a uh, semi-auto, there are three types of malfunctions. The first is a failure to fire. In this kind of situation, I'm engaging the target, I pull the trigger, and I hear click. That'll be the loudest sound you've ever heard in your life when you expected a boom but got a click. That's a failure to fire. It can be caused by a bad cartridge that did not go off. It could also be caused by a partially unseated magazine that didn't get seated all the way. So when you cycled the slide, it didn't pick up around. In other words, you got an empty chamber. That's why you got the click. So could be bad round, could be empty chamber. The solution for both of them is the same. Make sure that the magazine is seated. Tap. Now we're going to do a rack to get rid of that bad round or to put the round in the chamber that we didn't have and now we're ready to go. Very simple process. Tap, rack, and back on target. That's a type 1 malfunction which is a failure to fire. A type 2 malfunction is a failure to eject. It did not kick out an empty round the last time you fired the weapon. We call this a smokestack. Looks like a smokestack sticking up out of a ship. Could be off to the side. Could be the I've seen the, the, the cases turned around backwards and, and caught in there. The point is, for some reason, this round didn't get thrown out. It jammed everything up. We've got a loaded round in there, a loaded magazine in there, so we still got rounds available. The solution to this failure to eject is simple. It's the same as a type one. We want to tap just because we're in the habit of doing that. We want to rack. And now we've got a round in there. And I will show you. Okay, so that round comes out. 
once again we will set this up you see a smokestack of some type we know we have rounds in the magazine we tap the rack you might need to shake it free and we're back on target that's a type 2 malfunction a type 3 malfunction is a failure to extract that means the cartridge fired the slide cycled but the fired casing for some reason did not come out of the chamber it can be caused by overpression over pressure with a cartridge it can be caused by dirt that is accumulated in there there can be a number of reasons so what we have is a fired cartridge case in the chamber we have another live cartridge trying to feed up the ramp and get in there but there's no room for it a lot of instructors will call this a double feed it is not a double feed in the, in the case of a handgun double feeds occur in rifles which will have a double stack magazine that can feed from both the left and the right that that is a double feed because sometimes they will literally try to put two rounds in at the same time this is a failure to extract bad cartridge fired cartridge did not come out new cartridge tried to get up in there this is a problem this is going to take some time to fix for most semi-automatics you need to get cover you need to get some time because you need to lock that slide to the rear you need to drop the magazine and and a lot of times the magazine will not drop free on its own so you're going to need to grab hold of it and rip it out okay? when you do that a lot of times this partially seated round will pop free you're looking for it to drop out as you pull that magazine out at this point you need to drop the slide cycle the slide a couple times until you see that cartridge come out and now we're going to do a speed load new magazine goes in if you have one if not because the magazine could be the cause of the problem so if possible drop that magazine go to a new one if you don't have a new one then you reinsert the old one you chamber around you're back in the fight so once again type 3 malfunction you're going to look in there you're going to see a round that's trying to get into the chamber but a cartridge that's still stuck in the firing or in the chamber is stopping that other round from going in so with most pistols lock the slide to the rear and when you withdraw that magazine you're looking for that loose round to fall you're going to lose that round if you have another magazine discard that one it could have been part of the problem you still have a, stick, a case stuck in the chamber. So you cycle the slide. You get that out. Then you do a speed load with a new magazine. You're coming in. Magazine in. Slide is racked. Sights are on target. We're back in the fight. It takes a while. With Glock pistols, there is an alternative way to clear this malfunction that's generally a lot faster. But it's still a good idea to get some cover. Uh, get the time you need to do it. Instead of taking the time to lock the slide to the rear with the Glock, you can get a hold of this magazine, rip it out, and with most Glocks, not, not on the 48, but on the double stack, there's a cutout in the back here where you can actually get your thumb up in there if need be and rip that magazine out. So you saw when I ripped the magazine out, the slide went down on its own. Now I clear that bad round, back in with a loaded magazine, cycle, and back on target. So the Glock, you, you eliminate the step of needing to, to lock the slide to the rear. When you rip, it will automatically drop the slide, cycle out the bad one, load the pistol, you're back in the fight. Okay. These seem complicated once you learn how to do them, to set them up and do them in live fire practice. They work pretty quick. It's important to do these so many times and under as much time stress as you can give yourself that you program this very deeply into your mindset. I'll give you an example of how deeply uh, these techniques of, of malfunction clearing can be programmed. Uh, a number of years ago, after the Columbine school attack in 1999, uh, the Illinois State Police was preparing to train rapid deployment response or active shooter response to all the troopers. Um, well, how to handle these situations differently um, than they did in, in Columbine. The, Training we were doing involved simunitions. Uh, I don't have any here to show you. Simunitions fire paint bullets instead of conventional bullets, and you require either a special pistol or, or a special slide. Uh, we we had uh, the blue 
Glocks, uh, blue designates the training guns, they will only fire simunitions. And simunitions hurt. They sting like hell when you, when you catch them. So typically we'd wear gloves, eye protection, throat protection, uh, and as much padding as we could stand because as a role player you get shot a lot and it, it kind of adds up. I was just taking photographs this day. Uh, the, we had experienced firearms instructors going through the training. They were going to become the rapid deployment instructors. And, and this was simunitions role playing. So this is as close to a real gunfight as we can get them. As I'm following along taking pictures, a friend of mine, Master Sergeant Kelly Holsey, excellent firearms instructor, he had a malfunction on that Glock 17 T. Um, they get smokestacks. So when they get dirty, then the empty cases would tend to get stuck in that uh, chamber area. He didn't hesitate for even a second. I got the camera on motor drive, so I'm catching all this. I realized he'd had a malfunction. He did a tap, a rack, he cleared it, he's right back on target, and he smacked the role player with a couple more rounds. At lunch, I commented, hey Kelly, nice job you know, clearing your malfunction you had during, during that one role playing incident. And he looked at me with a funny look and he goes, what malfunction was that? And I said, you had a smokestack, but you cleared it and you went on. And he goes, I don't have any memory of having a malfunction. I don't think I cleared one. So I got the camera out and I showed him that, that motor drive sequence of events where the pistol malfunctioned, he cleared it, went right back into the fight. He had absolutely no recollection that he had had a malfunction or that he had cleared the malfunction. He was superbly trained. His midbrain took care of the problem. It, rec it recognized the problem. It did the tap rack, got him back in the fight while his high order, his, his main brain was thinking about sight alignment. Is this a legitimate target that I need to engage? The midbrain typically does not record what it does. And it did not record that he had cleared a malfunction. So he had no memory of it at all. And, and you know, in, in firearms training, there are, there are people out there who believe in point shooting. Uh, their philosophy is that under most circumstances, cops, military, whoever, in, in pistol type fights, that they're not going to be able to focus on the sights, get a good sight picture and use it. So their philosophy is instead of using the sights, we're gonna do kind of point shooting. We're, we're gonna get into muscle memory, get the pistol down below our line of sight, and engage the targets that way. Point shooting can work if you do it a lot, if you do it all the time, it can be a viable way to do things. In, in my opinion, it's not viable for most of us because we simply don't shoot every day. We don't shoot enough to, to polish those muscle memory skills. And, and a lot of the, the, the point shooters, when, when they ask cops, did you use your sights? And typically for years, the cops would go, I don't remember using my sights. So the point shooters say, therefore, we can't train people to use their sights because they can't do it under stress. Here's my philosophy. I think they are using their sights, but they're well trained enough that it's the midbrain that's taking care of those mechanical things that need to go on. The forebrain is, is worrying about something else, but the midbrain does not record what it does. So the last few cops that I have interviewed after a gunfight, I don't ask them, did you use your sights? I ask them, do you remember using your sights? And several of them have said, no, I don't remember using my sights, but he said, I've thought about this. I don't think I could have made that shot if I didn't use my sights. So, you know, I'm, I'm not beating up on the point shooting people any more than I have to, except I, I think they're basing their philosophy on an aspect of the brain that they're not taking into account. The midbrain can do a lot of this work for us if we do it enough and we do when we learn it under stress, it can be programmed to the point where we can multitask. Part of our brain is, is sending the signals out to clear the malfunction, while the high order part of our brain is looking at the target and making those kind of critical decisions. Okay, this is mechanics. It is very important um, and, and we need to go beyond what we're just talking about here. Eventually, you need to do one hand shooting. You need to be able to reload with one hand. Um, I, I like Dick Heine sights. I mentioned them earlier. If you notice, it's got kind of a ledge there. 
that ledge allows you to hook that rear sight on a belt or a boot heel or something and, and stroke that pistol to clear a malfunction with only one hand. Why do we need that? Because this hand may get shot. And another thing that I've learned in training, doing these simunition trainings, I, I spent a lot of time as the role player. I'm the bad guy who's getting shot at by the cadets going through the training. I learned to wear the heaviest gloves I could get because a lot of times you're taking hits in the hands. These cadets are focusing, their, 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 their whole being is focusing in on the threat and the threat is the gun. So it's not unusual for them to fire at the gun and you take hits in your hand. It's not unusual for cops in a gunfight to lose the operation of one hand for that very reason. Okay, So you gotta be able to run the gun one-handed, cycle the slide, fire one-handed. If it's your right hand that goes down or your main hand that goes down, primary, then you gotta go to your weak hand. So we need to practice training one hand, weak hand, reloading. These are a lot of things that we need to take into effect here. Mechanics is, in my opinion, very important for the continuity of a gunfight. Okay, I'll plug my book again. All of these mindset, mechanics, marksmanship. This training cycle is outlined in the book Building a Better Gunfighter. It's available on dickfairburn.com or eBay. And if you've watched clear to the end of this, then I thank you for your time. I appreciate, um, it's an honor to, to it's always been an honor for me to stand up in front of people and tell them what I know and think that that may benefit them in some way. So uh, if you appreciate what's going on here, hit the subscribe, give me a thumbs up, hit the uh, notification bell, and um, thank you very much. The next M we're going to talk about is the most important, and that's mindset. Okay, we've got them both here now. You ready? Bud got one. Ginger got one. Huh? Oh, she missed it. She usually gets them, doesn't she, bud? Mm -hmm. Okay, girl, last one. You ready? You ready? Yeah! That's all there is till next time.